All right. Welcome to Reparations Conversations, the Taylor's Talk, White Supremacy Reparations in the Church. Today, we have a special guest with us, my friend, Dr. Michael Rhodes. Hey. Michael is an Old Testament lecturer at Cary Baptist College in Auckland, New Zealand, and author of books and articles, including Practicing the King's Economy and The Case for Jubilee Reparations. He's an ordained pastor in the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. So thank you for being with us today, Michael. Yeah, really happy to be here, Will. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, when we talked about Reparations Now, NWA in the fall, I asked you to write uh, an endorsement for us, which you graciously did. So I wanted to read that briefly and then ask you to expand on it. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Uh, but you wrote, Scripture calls God's people to be jubilee people. And as we argued in practicing the king's economy, Jubilee people radically and sacrificially seek a world in which everyone has a social and economic stake in the community. Tragically, though, there's a long history of the white church in America choosing instead an anti-Jubilee way of life, especially in relation to our black and brown brothers and sisters. Through Northwest Arkansas's partnership with The Witness and Reparations Now, God's people have the opportunity to declare a jubilee repenting and repairing the sins and failures of our ancestors by investing in the next generation of black Christian leaders. I strongly commend this work. So today, Michael, I just wanted to have a short conversation asking you to expand on that endorsement. So I've got three questions for you. The first uh, is how has the white church in America chosen an anti-jubilee way of life? Yeah, thanks, Lowell. And um, thanks for giving me the opportunity again to talk with you about this stuff. I'm, I'm encouraged by what you guys are working on. Um, you know, this is a huge question, and I'm not a historian, and so I don't have all the answers. But um, I've spent the last uh, almost, I'm working on 11 years living in a majority African American community here in Memphis. Um, uh, which I got into as part of a community development initiative that I worked for called Advance Memphis for five years. And um, I'm a Memphian. And so as part of being a Christian in Memphis who came back home to Memphis and to this community um, that is one of the more economically impoverished neighborhoods in our city, I've, I've grown increasingly aware of some of this history. And so um, obviously that anti-Jubilee way of life goes back to slavery, uh, at least. And, you know, the white uh, church was deeply complicit in slavery. White pastors wrote the vast majority of all written defenses of slavery. So um, church leaders, church educated pastors were some of the most vocal supporters of slavery. Um, and of course, that anti-Jubilee theft did not end with slavery. Um, uh, the failure to make good on the promise of 40 acres and a mule in the immediate aftermath of slavery that would have allowed uh, Black Americans, Black former slaves to have that socioeconomic stake that I think is really at the heart of a lot of the Bible's vision. That was promised but denied. Um, and then that denial, that anti-Jubilee way of life continued. And it's important to recognize that that anti-Jubilee way of life um, was both formal uh, and informal. So of course, throughout the South um, in the Jim Crow era, the terror of lynching and just horrendous violence, terrorist violence against black people um, was a real feature and was a real feature that the church turned a blind eye to. In my own neighborhood, um, I'm about a mile from the People's Grocery which was a late 1800s era black owned cooperative grocery store. Um, and the three men who, who ran that thing, uh, it was successful enough that it was threatened to a white grocery store right here in my neighborhood. And that led to an armed confrontation and the three black owners of the people's grocery store were arrested and then they were taken out of the prison and lynched all three of them. And that, that all happened very close to my home here. And it was actually, uh, one of those men was Ida B. Wells' friend. And so that lynching actually catapulted her anti-lynching crusade. So um, 
right here in my neighborhood, I've had to think about the terrorism that really did dominate. So that was obviously an anti-jubilary, anti-jubilee thing that the church was often complicit in. Um, but it also happened like formally and legally. So, so black people were systematically screened out of all of the major wealth building initiatives of the 20th century. So whereas my white grandparent veterans came back from the war and had access to money to go to college and start businesses and all this stuff for the GI Bill, black Americans were almost exclusively or exhaustively screened out of those programs. Whereas um, my white family members had opportunities to, to build wealth through home ownership with FHA backed loans because of redlining, um, which worked through the bank uh, and through uh, legislation, black people were denied access to build wealth through their homes. So like, just like right there with the home ownership thing, if, if you look at, um, you know, white average white household wealth, which is like somewhere between 10 and 14 times average black household wealth, a lot of that is tied up in homes. And the reason why, a direct reason why white people have so much more wealth in their homes is because the government made it really easy to buy homes and redlining made it really hard for black families to buy homes and exposed them to like all sorts of predatory housing behavior. Um, I used to think, by the way, that redlining was like a metaphor. It's not. In Memphis, they've turned up the maps. So I've seen the maps that include my neighborhood with red lines around them where banks would not make loans there because there were you know, too many black people there. And the church was involved in all of this all along the way, you know? And so um, uh, when uh, someone like, um, James Foreman shows up with the Black Manifesto and saying to churches, you need to pay reparations. Uh, the reason why many Black Christians at the time said, yeah, that's right, was because as one group put it, the white church has been the moral cement of white supremacy in this country in the past and in the present. So, so the claim um, that uh, white Americans have embraced this kind of anti-Jubilee way of life towards black people and that Christians and churches have by and large been very complicit in that. I don't think it's debatable. It's a history that is hard and difficult and unknown, but, but it, the facts are there. And, you know, for me personally, I mean, I come from a church background where our church had an explicit policy of segregation into the 1950s, right? And so um, this is a part of my church Christian story. And it's, it's one that I've had to grapple with uh, very personally. Um, so, so, so I think w the Christians have to come to grips with the fact that we have this vision of a Jubilee way of life and every vine and fig tree economy where every family has a socioeconomic place to stand and portion to steward. And yet we we've often done worked for and settled for the exact opposite um, in relation to our, our black brothers and sisters. Thank you for sharing that, Michael. I know you speak to that um, at some length in Practicing the King's Economy, uh, The Sins of Our Fathers, I think is the section of the chapter. I don't recall the chapter name, but um, yeah, thank you for, for sharing that with us more briefly yeah, now. Yeah, the other side of that story, of course, is, is um, Native Americans. And, you know, <laughs> and uh, we talk a little bit about that as well. I've been really challenged um, by some um, uh, Native American evangelical brothers like uh, Richard Twist and Mark Charles, who really forced me to reckon with that as well, which is an even newer story for me in some ways. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a tragedy that Christians um, not only haven't stood up for this kind of jubilee vision, but we've actually embraced and enacted its opposite far too often. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Mark Charles. I read his um he he and Sun Jin Ra um uh. You probably remember the name of that book, um, uh, The Doctrine of Discovery, The Doctrine of Discovery, and uh, blew my mind. Um, really good, really hard stuff. Hmm. Um, so the second question, Michael, where do we see Jubilee in the Bible? Um, you're an Old Testament scholar um, and professor, and, and how might the Jubilee speak to the contemporary debate about reparations? Yeah. So you might have to rein me in here, Lowell, because not only am I an Old Testament Bible person who's written on the Jubilee, I actually named our fourth child. My wife and I named our fourth child, my daughter, Jubilee. So this is something I could go on and on and on about. Um, hey, I'm just going to go on mute and you just talk as long as you want, okay? 
<laughs> so I think you uh, in your community, you guys have have engaged. I know you have Lowell um, engaged in a uh, uh, engaged with um, um, Greg Thompson and Duke Kwan's new book on reparations, which I actually I have on my shelf. I haven't read it yet, but Duke and Greg are actually the guys who got me thinking about reparations first and uh, partially because um, uh, Pastor Kwan was reading our book and, and asked me when I was engaging with him about it, why we didn't talk about reparations. And he was the one who told me about this black manifesto, this, you know, demand for reparations um, from the church. And so I thought, well, I wonder if um, I, I had thought of reparations exclusively as a public policy question previously to that. And in practicing the King's economy, we explicitly don't treat public policy questions. So it just never crossed my mind that those two things would intersect. But Duke said, so, well, have you heard about, um, you know, the Black Manifesto and this, this demand for reparations from the church? And so I, I went to the Jubilee with this question. Does the way the Jubilee works speak to this contemporary question about reparations? And on the one hand, the first thing I want to say is I think that Leviticus 25 in its context and with 26 does really speak to some of the primary um, claims involved in the case for reparations. Uh, first of all, it gives this vision, as we've been talking about, of, of this every vine and fig tree, you know, um, everyone having a place to stand and a portion to steward, that overall vision, right, um, which is at the heart of the Bible, is also at the heart of, I think, a heart of the case for reparations, you know, this idea that that the black community has been disenfranchised and for their own well-being and for their for the flourishing of the black community what's needed is 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 economic wealth and power that will allow thriving and flourishing to happen i think leviticus 25 has that every vine and fig tree vision so you've got that positive vision but secondly leviticus 25 also addresses the question how do we think about economic injustice over the course of generations, right? So, um, uh, you know, as, as um, your friend and my friend Greg Thompson pointed out to me one time, nobody disagrees that if I take something from you, Lowell, that you ought to give it back. And as I've said, I think it's uncontroversial to say that my ancestors, at least, uh, took stuff from, you um, black descendants of slaves ancestors. So we all agree that back then, right, uh, that was wrong. And if that had been called out, the people who took something should have returned it. Everyone sort of agrees with that. And, it, and in the arguments about reparations, people have, have often said, yeah, that should have happened, right? But the question is, and this comes up, you know, when Congress debates these things, you know, someone like Mitch McConnell said something to the effect of, you know, I don't think a program where people um are are repaying people who did not take the land are repaying that debt to the descendants of people right that it's that multi-generational aspect that throws people off and that makes people go like is this really right you know and so what i think we find in the year of jubilee is an example of that dynamic at work because the way the jubilee works is it says you may lose your land anybody might lose their land for any reason right and the way you lose your land, it could be natural disaster, it could be ineptitude. You know, I'm a bad farmer, so I stink at farming. So I run out of, I don't have any seed to plant this year. So I might sell a portion of my land to you, Lowell, right? So that I can have seed to plant the rest of my land, right? That could happen. And what the Jubilee says is no matter how I lose my land, under any circumstance, if Lowell's family acquires my family land at the end of 50 years, you've got to give it back, right? It doesn't matter how I lost it. However, the text makes clear that one way you might lose your land is through oppression. That's why it says three times in Leviticus 25, do not oppress your neighbor in any of these ways. So Leviticus 25 is aware that one of the ways that land changes hands is through injustice and oppression. And what's interesting is, and it's easy to miss this because 50 years doesn't sound like that long to us, but the average life expectancy for a male in Israel, we think would be something around the neighborhood of 40 years, right? And the people who make land decisions are the heads of the household. So they're not going to start making decisions about the household land until they're at least in their 20s or 30s. So it would be very common that if 
I cheated you, Lowell, out of your land, both of us might well be dead by the time the year of Jubilee rolls around, right? And in that situation, what the Jubilee requires is that your descendants pursue justice by restoring land that was taken from my family to my descendants. So you have an example in scripture where justice requires a return of the land, a return of something that was taken, a a repair that's occurring between the descendants, at least on some occasions, of both the perpetrators and the victims, right? And, And in fact, that is not just like a practical thing, it's theological, because in Leviticus 26, the very next chapter where we first learn about the year of Jubilee in Leviticus 25, God says, you know, if you if you break all these laws and you suffer the consequences for disobedience, you're going to go into exile. But in exile, if you repent for your sins and the sins of your fathers, then I will restore you, right? And so this idea, which is so unusual to us, theologically and practically, that, that, that God might call us to repent of our sins and the sins of our forefathers, shows up not only in Leviticus 26, but it shows up in lots of places. In Daniel 9, Daniel prays, Father, forgive us for our sins and the sins of our forefathers. In Nehemiah, you have the people repenting for their sins and the sins of their forefathers. So this idea theologically that we are so connected to our community, to the people of God, that we can get caught up in their sin and need to repent of their their sin, need to proactively turn from their sin and our sin, shows up over and over and over again in the Old Testament. But in Leviticus 25, that repentance isn't just an expression of repentance. It isn't just a turning away from the pattern of behavior left by our parents. It actually involves repairing some of the damage done through exchanges between the descendants of both the perpetrator and the victim. So I think if you're looking for a biblical example of repair, economic repair, uh, at the communal level and at a later generational level, Leviticus 25, the year of Jubilee, is the best place to go. And, you know, lots of people when they hear about the year of Jubilee, they'll say, okay, hey, yeah, but it never happened, right? Well, first of all, that's very questionable. We also don't have any record that the Day of Atonement happened but most of us think that's pretty important. And second of all, whether God's people do what they're supposed to do is not really all that relevant to ethics. They never really got the whole uh, don't commit adultery with your wife right thing either, but you and I both know that's really important, right? So some of this, it never really happened is, is kind of silly, but the more important thing is to pay attention to the way the Jubilee doesn't live just back there in Leviticus 25. It gets picked up and it inspires the people of God again and again. So it inspires uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah's eschatological imaginations. You know, one day God will declare the big jubilee where we're restored from our, but it's also social and practical, right? And so, so we see Jesus picking up the year of jubilee in, through his quote of Isaiah 61 and declaring the year of the Lord's favor. And he says, hey, today, this year of jubilee is being fulfilled in your hearing. And he's there in Luke 4 quoting Isaiah 61. And is that spiritual? Well, you dadgum better believe it's spiritual, but it's also more than that because then we see Jesus going on and doing jubilee things, right? Um, caring for people's bodies and minds and all this. And, and then in Acts 2 and 4, when the people of God are sharing possessions in the early church, um, they actually, Luke actually quotes Deuteronomy 15, another jubilary debt forgiveness passage to say, and there were no needy persons among them. So that's, I'm moving really quick there, but my point is simply to say this Jubilee vision creatively inspires God's people across redemptive history in both the Old and New Testaments. So it's not a stretch to say that maybe God gives the American church this Jubilee vision to say, hey, how would this inspire you to think about this uh, claim against you about reparations? And I think it would, it would inspire us to say, well, look, God seems to think that at least on some occasions, we have the privilege of repenting and repairing our ancestors' mistakes by restoring some of what was taken, right? So it's right in there. But another thing that I think that that the year of Jubilee does for us, and I think this cannot be missed, right? 
it's almost nothing like more that people like less than the idea of inherited responsibility. People hate that. And people hate the idea of, uh, all people hate the idea of any of taxes and, and, and all this sort of stuff, right? And so the idea of like, hey, this is gonna cost you to repair these transgressions that, that you weren't the original agent of those transgressions, right? Like I am caught up in racism, I am caught up in white supremacy, no doubt, right? But I did not enslave people. I have not been the one who proactively took land from me. So this feels painful. People don't like it. We don't, this is uncomfortable. Nobody is jazzed about this for, within the white community, right? And this is another gift that I think that the, that the year of Jubilee gives to us because the year of Jubilee in its context is all about joy and the good life for everyone, right? So when does the year of Jubilee happen? It happens on the day of atonement when you announce that God has forgiven you all of your debts and sins. And therefore you forgive all of your debts, right? And you experience forgiveness of sin and forgiveness of debts by being restored to your own land. This is a good community, right? Second, this year of Jubilee is a community in which everyone's security is bound up in their ability to depend on everyone else. So, so the Jubilee year doesn't say, hey, you wealthy person, you need to give land. It says any of you, any of you, if at any point in your history run into hardship, you can depend on one another. So why do we cling today so much on our possessions? Why do we cling to our rights? Why do we cling to our power and our economic? It's because we're afraid of being left alone. But the Jubilee says you're not alone. Everything belongs to God. You belong to God. You're his tenants. The land belongs to God. It's his. And because of that, you can trust that God will provide for you through his people. So Jubilee says, hey, it's good news that we can take our hands off the wheel, that we can release our resources in a variety of ways, because God will take care of us through this community that takes care of one another. So what, what, kind, of, what kind of thing is this Jubilee thing? It's, 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 it's an opportunity for joy. How do we know this? Because God declares it, you declare the Jubilee, in the middle of a two-year vacation where you're not allowed to work. God knows the Jubilee is going to be a hard sell. So he says you can't work the year before and you can't the work the year of. And for those two years, you feast off the abundance of the land itself along with the orphan and the immigrant and the debt servant and the poor and the wild animals who are all feasting with you because my gifts are so great. And what I want for you is joy. So I think when we think about, you know, reparations or whatever, at least if we're thinking about them in a Jubilee way, we should understand that God is inviting us into a way of life that's shot through with joy, right? A way of life that's shot through with connection and, and belonging and togetherness that we long for and often don't experience, right? A life that's, that's shot through with an end to kind of the relentless, this is the good life. This is a jubilant way of life. And the door in is love of God and love of neighbor in costly ways, including perhaps forgiving debts that people owe us, but also including repairing the injustices that our family may have have gotten caught up in. And so I think, um, you know, when James Foreman uh, came with the Black Manifesto, he addressed the church simply as an institution that was guilty, right? And in the face of that claim, I think we have just have to say guilty as charged for the most part. But what James Foreman didn't know, but that Leviticus does, is that the church is also a community that is holy to the Lord, that is called to be holy as God is holy, and that means that whatever God is calling us into is good news for us and for the world. And so if we're thinking reparations, if we're thinking justice, if we're thinking generosity, if we're thinking economics in a jubilee key, that's not some like dour. Blah, 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 blah. This is like the way of life and joy that God has invited us to. And we've messed it up. So it's, there might be some pain as we pursue it. But let's be clear that what we're being invited into is, is the good news of the kingdom of God express and experience economically. So I know I said a lot there. I could say a lot more there. Um, as you mentioned, I actually have not uh, published on this, but I am working 
uh, on a couple chapters in a book that I'm working on, on, on justice and, and discipleship and scripture. And this has really, um, this, that, that's allowed me to do some research on the case for reparations and the year of Jubilee. And it has been so inspiring to me. And it has made me want to figure out more and more what it looks like to participate in a Jubilee way of life um, in, in every area, but not least this, this question of, of reparations and the church's role in that. So thanks for letting me ramble on about that. And I, I'm happy to answer further questions about the year of Jubilee if you've got them, uh, because there's so much more to say. <laughs> I love it, brother. You, you, could, you could preach for a long time without missing. Uh, and you need, to, you need to hurry up and write that book so I can read it. Uh, man, Michael, I think, well, well, one, I mean, we've talked about practicing the King's economy, which you co-wrote. And so I think people need to read that. And then uh, your podcast uh, with Chalmers, Potlucking with Jesus, I think is some really good stuff too. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, you'll have to let us know when you write that book. Man, I think for me, having read Reparations by Quan and Thompson, they make their case uh, in, in biblically, primarily from Luke, yeah. um, Luke 10 and Luke 19, um, the Good Samaritan and, and Zacchaeus. And so it's so good to hear you expand um, on, on that biblical case yeah. for reparations, primarily, but not exclusively from Leviticus 25 and 26. And I think, yep. um, you know, uh, Unsettling Truths is the name of the, the yes. book that Charles and, and Ra wrote. And as I hear you talk about the joy uh, in Jubilee um, and connecting that with uh, the truth that sets us free, right? Mm-hmm. Jesus said that you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. Well, that truth, I mean, it, it has unsettled me mm-hmm. um, and it has um, made me feel bad. <laughs> um, and I think to your point, like as a white person, like that's correct. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a part uh, of, I, I should feel guilty. Um, but there's a, a grief that doesn't, that doesn't end in grief. Like it leads to life, you know, because yeah. to your point, man, confession and repentance are gifts from yeah. God and, and pathways into life. And so I think, man, I agree with you that as I've taken, you know, my family and I baby steps towards reparations, towards a Jubilee way of life. Um, it's a harder and better way to live. Yeah. Um, and it's more consistent with, with the truth and, and there's freedom in that. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, Michael, we could talk forever. Um, I, I think, you know, I told you that I wanted to hear from you um, how your case for reparations has, has been received. I think a question that's been on my mind, um, you know, based on my experiences to, to your point, I think that the, the evidence for reparations is difficult to dispute. Mm. Um, you, you said that these, these truths are not debatable, but they're not well known. Yeah. And so I think that as a white person and as a white Christian, there's a sense in which um, it's difficult to say um, this theory is incorrect. But it's very easy to say this is very uncomfortable for me as a white person. And so I don't want to talk about this. And mm. so... Um, I, I imagine if your experience is like mine, a case for reparations is received differently uh, by white people and, and black and brown people. And, and so I would love to hear you speak, um, perhaps personally, pastorally, in, in whatever way you want to, um, about your experience in terms of how your work has been received. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to clarify something there, Lowell, that you said that I would I would say a little bit differently. I think that the case of the damage that was done historically is undeniable. I think that's completely undeniable. And I think, I do think that the case that um, black people and brown people and non-white people generally face enormous structural barriers to flourishing today is undeniable. Although, you know, there is more debate there. Um, people do want to debate that more than they do the history of theft and abuse and violence and terrorism. Um, But I am not surprised at all that Americans in the church and outside of it find reparations very difficult because Americans in the church and outside of it are hyper-individualists, right? So it's actually not 
you, you know, when people say the case for reparations is obvious, I want to say the case for the damage done is obvious. If we deny that, we're, it's willful ignorance at this stage. I think that if we deny the president suffering an experience of black and brown people, that's also willful ignorance. But the case that each one of us is liable, it, it, it has an obligation to participate in the solution, uh, that actually is extremely debatable because we've invested in a dehumanizing, uh, unbiblical individualism for hundreds of years in the church and outside of it, right? So I, I actually think that even though biblically we should be really, it should be really easy for us to see like, hey, I'm connected to other people, even people who have gone before, like that should be obvious in some ways biblically. As an American, it's the strangest thing ever. So I actually think it's not surprising that in, when in Congress or in church or wherever else, people have a hard time making the case for reparations because in America, I don't accept, I don't expect, I don't accept responsibility for anybody living or dead, right? So I think we need to be, I think we need to take just how foreign in some ways the Bible's account of intergenerational sin, intergenerational repair is and say, hey, th this is a, bri a far bridge from where we, our cultural impulse, and take that seriously, and then say, let's look at what scripture actually says, you know, so I'm not surprised that we have a hard time, I, I do not think that reparations is obvious to Americans, I think the harm is obvious, and, and the idea that we each have a responsibility to repair it is true, but not obvious, and so that's where a lot of the, the work comes in, you know, um, so how do black people and white people in my, in my world, you know, and again, I want to say like we wrote Practicing the Keynes Economy, that what came out in 2018. And then I, this, for me, uh, the academic study of reparations in dialogue with scripture is just a year or two old. So I'm, I'm still on the front edge of, of thinking about these things, trying to do so with a, um, a rigorously biblical perspective. So, um, and, you know, of course, COVID and everything, I haven't had as much of a chance as I'd like to talk about this with other people. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to do so. Um, I think what's one difference, so if you think about differences, um, the reality of the theft, of the damage, of the terrorism, uh, Black people in my life feel that and know that history at such a deep level, right? That history is just so well known and it's known not least in the black church because the black church has been uh as somebody puts it i can't remember which black scholar is used this language it has been the citadel of hope amidst the history of racism and white supremacy in this country right uh it has been the the institution that people have run into uh for survival and so um, uh, not only is the Black community deeply aware of this history, not only did their parents and grandparents live the redlining and all the rest, you know, um, but, but the church has been a place where these things have been talked about. And so um, um, I think, the, the, you know, I, I got a chance to co-teach a course on the gospel and ethnicity with my friend uh, and pastor, a pastor and mentor to me, Mike Davis at a seminary here in Memphis this summer. And, you know, we spent a full half day on the history of like, where did these ideas about racism come from? And, and they are very new to white people. This history has not been told. And so on the one hand, uh, we know slavery was bad, blah, blah, but the depth, the persistence, the variety of ways um, and shapes that white supremacy has taken Historically, in the present, there's just, you know, um, if if reparations is about repair, our kind of felt sense of what needs to be repaired is very different in the black church and in the white church, in the black community, white community, from my observation. Um, uh, in terms of the case for reparations specifically, um, you know, it is interesting that again. Uh, the, the acceptability of the idea of reparations in the black community and the white community has changed over time, right? So it's becoming more acceptable in both communities. Um, I think I talked to a, uh, I have a, a mentor, a black pastor friend here in Memphis who pastors a very large church. He is 
um, uh, my friend is, you know, very um, evangelical, if you like, in his perspective on scripture and the gospel and whatever else, um, but is part of a church that has played a really important role in advocating for the for the black community in Memphis here for a long time. And I asked him what percentage of your congregation today um, would, you know, be down with this idea of reparations. He said, essentially 100%. He said, now, how many of them are going to going to get out and advocate for it and push for it? That's different. But, um, you know, it's essentially 100%. Whereas when I have talked to friends and family members and, you know, had people read some of the stuff that I'm, you know, drafts and stuff I'm working on, some stuff you've read, Lowell, um, there's two kind of responses. I think from kind of white liberal progressives, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But what I want to know is, are we actually ready to, to invest in this thing that we're talking about, right? So there's an acceptance of the idea on paper, but I have yet to see the commitment. And I and myself am still trying to imagine and, and consider what that commitment looks like practically on the ground. Um, and then from a lot of um, uh, white Christians who I think are uh, concerned about racial injustice and, and um, concerned about white supremacy and, and want to see something change, I think reparations is still uh, sort of sets off alarm bells for them because they think, well, okay, I mean, if you, if you give a bunch of money to people right away without any strings attached or whatever, it's not going to create all sorts of problems. And they immediately jump to kind of pragmatic kind of questions. You know, like, are we just going to all get checks in the mail? Is that going to be good for people? Um, and I think there's a couple things that are important to be said there. One is um, the year of Jubilee, if we're, if we're going to go back to the year of Jubilee, uh, it speaks to that in two ways. One is what's redistributed, what comes back to the family at the year of Jubilee is not, um, it's not uh, income, it's, it's, it's assets, right? The farm is not income, it's, it's not cash, it's, it's an asset that will produce uh, for a lifetime. And that connects with what guys like um, uh, William Darity, a black economist at Duke, who's been working on reparations for, for decades. You know, he says uh, uh, overcoming the wealth gap should be the primary goal of a reparations program. And I think he's right about that. And I think Jubilee speaks to that. And connected to that wealth deal is that the Jubilee is also about uh, power, right? It's about each family having a stake, a social and economic stake, a place where they can live out their calling to be, in the Bible's terms, uh, royal priestly family members of God, right? Kings, queens, priests, priestesses, sons and daughters of the living God, image bearers, right? Uh, little Adams and Eves over their plot, right? That's the human, uh, in the ancient Near East, the kings have all the power, and the biblical vision, everyone has a royal responsibility. They all... Uh, Power is uh, democratized in that sense, right? And so uh, Leviticus gives us a glimpse of one way you might actually live that out. Everyone gets their own farm, right? Everyone gets their own vine and fig tree. And, um, you know, in our example earlier, uh, I may have lost my farm to you through my own ineptitude, but you die, I die, your jubilee comes, your kids have to give my kids the farm back. And it doesn't matter if they have reason to think that my kids might have inherited some of my ineptitude, right? They just have to do it. So, so there's a power dynamic at work in the year of Jubilee that I think has also been a consistent part of, of the case for reparations, right? Black people have not just said, you know, we want, some, that ca they say, we want 40 acres and a mule. We want the ability uh, to um, um, control our own destiny in that sense. If you look at the Black Manifesto, the desire is not just for money, it's for a publishing arm. It's for land in the South to help farmers. It's for uh, 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 colleges and research centers. It's for uh, money to invest in black owned cooperative businesses that would create new avenues for wealth. Right. So, so there's, so there's a couple things that, that I would say about that in responding to this, this white claim of, well, how would this be done? And would this really be good? One thing is to say, white people making the decisions about money is part of the problem. So a, a, a huge part of the, of the kind of case for reparations is to say, uh, uh, if, if, if it's the sins of our forefathers and foremothers that created the problem, uh, us being in charge of the solutions is problematic, right? So there is a real need 
to take our hands off the wheel and say, we are not in control of the universe, right? And so any reparations program worth its salt is going to require um, white people to worry less about how everything gets done, right? So that's one thing to say, right? Um, but another thing to say, and I think this is honestly one of the biggest obstacles, um, is to say that um, the there actually is like now decades of scholarship on how a reparations program could be run. And it is pretty smart, right? So to take just William Darity's own argument, you know, he's made a case for, yes, there would be some cash payments because that's an important part of kind of the symbolic deal of, of, of repaying. Um, but as I read him, a large part of reparation funds would go into a super fund that qualified African Americans would be able to apply to to use for all sorts of wealth building initiatives, buying a home, starting a business, going to school, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's not this kind of, in other words, people have given a lot of thought to how best to design a reparations program. Um, and so before we jump on the, well, this would never work, this will create all sorts of unintended consequences, da, da, da. I don't want to deny that there aren't some legitimate thoughts there, right? Um, everybody working on reparations, I think, has recognized uh, that there are some legitimate questions about the how, right? But there have also been a lot of really strong answers provided, right? And I think that's probably true at the ecclesial level as well. Um, you know, William Darity again makes the point that if you if you if a, if a reparations program was just cash, if you just wrote checks to everybody in the amount uh, that you determined were due for reparations, given the state of ownership in America, that would basically function as a subsidy to white owners of capital, right? Because those dollars would get spent in institutions and businesses largely owned to white by white people. So there are legitimate mechanism questions. But, you know, I think we have an obligation if we're going to raise those questions to listen to the people who've been trying to put answers to them. And there are answers. And I think that in our book, Practicing the King's Economy, if a church wanted to practice reparations, some of the stuff we talk about in there about promoting black wealth in a variety of ways um, could be uh, applied to an ecclesial reparations program, although I would want to say anything that's called reparation should involve putting decision-making power for funds in the hands of the black community. Not just because that's what the, the, the demand for reparations has been, but again, because that Jubilee idea that is, that is um, uh, zero interest loans are a good idea, right? Deuteronomy 15. Uh, a social food bank for orphans, immigrants, widows, that's a good idea. Deuteronomy 14, 28 to 29. A, a limit to debt bondage is a good idea. Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 18. But eventually, at least once every 50 years, every family has to have renewed access to the factors of production, to the stuff that makes stuff, to the land that their family has agency and power over in the economy, right? That, and that's just that's just a part of the biblical vision, right? Now we have to figure out how to move from here to there, lots to be said, but hopefully I've given enough biblical impetus to say it's worth seriously engaging. Uh, well, I think we have to seriously engage with the history of injustice against black people, the present of injustice against black people. I think that's required by all sorts of, for all sorts of reasons, but hopefully I've given enough biblical impetus to say, we should also explore this idea of reparations, you know? Uh, trying to repair the damage cross-generationally through significant economic action put under the authority of Black people, um, whether that's through the church or through society. Hopefully, I've given enough argument to say we should take those ideas seriously and come at them with biblical eyes, eyes at least shaped by the jubilary vision of Leviticus 25, right? So that's a long answer to a short question. Um, I, in my world, I think people are hopeful about the idea that something could be done. I think people know in new ways that racism, white supremacy is a deep wound, right? And we want, I think most people in my world want to see something done. Um, and so, and, and maybe there's a growing willingness to do something about it. Um, and I think uh, that's where some of this 
year of Jubilee and some of the case for reparations can maybe spur us to more productive creative action. Mm. Mm. Yes and amen. Um, we, we should probably wrap it up because I imagine you have other things to do today. Uh, Darity, uh, from here to equality, that's what yes. you're talking about, right? Yeah, it, it, uh, which he which he co-authored, but but he's been publishing in economics journals largely on reparations for I think decades, but certainly yeah. for years. But from here to equality would be a good way for folks to access him uh, if they don't want to read an economics journal. Yeah, <laughs> and then I know yeah the folks yeah. Uh, the ladies at a truth table yes reviewed him as well. Yes. so if that, you want like four five minutes, of, what's that? That's how I ran into him. Yeah. So that, that would be another easy way to, yeah. to access his stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely, we're, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if Darity is a believer or not, but he certainly puts to rest this idea that um, a case for reparations for descendants of slaves is, is unthoughtful or, or just obviously wouldn't work. Or that I mean, he gives enormous amounts of data and also looks at, I know you guys have talked about this, the fact that you know, reparations programs of various sorts have been done in this country and elsewhere. Now, there may be differences between those programs and the program that's being under consideration, but all of that makes this, uh, I, these ideas that, that we should treat as plausible, legitimate questions, you know? Um, and really, you know, I mean, however many years ago, when I read Tani C. Coates, The Case for Reparations, and, and the argument that he makes, he, I mean, he has this, this line where he says, basically, like, maybe it's impossible to do, but we've got to do the work of having the conversation, right? Now, I don't think it's impossible to do, and I don't think he does either. But I do think that as Christians, uh, we have a lot more energy that we can spend to understanding the claim that's being made and to thinking deeply about our sacred text and how our sacred text might intersect with the claims that are being made before we can write this stuff off. So for people who are skeptical, I just want to say, like, I just think there's a lot I, I, um, what is it? What, what's the song by, um, you may be right. I may be crazy. Maybe, but I don't think we've spent enough time <laughs> deciding that this is crazy. I think there's a lot of work to be done here and we ought to get after it because, uh, the good news is that Jesus is inviting us into his kingdom and his kingdom is characterized by justice and characterized by joy and that's for Christians. That's what this is about, right? And um, I think uh, there's an enormous uh, missional in the deepest sense of the word to say this is a huge thing in our society. This this debate about reparations. What would it mean to walk with Jesus and engage these ideas? To say what does the church have to offer to this uh, deep, deep, deep conversation that's happening in our society what if scripture had some things to offer for how we thought about that good news it does yeah well Coates opens his case for reparations with a quote from i think it's deuteronomy it's just yeah. from the torah anyway yeah uh so yeah well i don't know a better way to end than with you singing uh so <laughs> billy think, joel i think that's billy joel <laughs> uh so we'll, we'll we'll kill it there uh michael thank you uh so much for spending time with me today i'm looking forward to uh, sharing your voice uh, with my friends here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, so unless you got anything else, um, we'll, we'll end it there. Yeah, and I, yeah, just that uh, this is, a, as I say, this is a conversation for me too, and I'm, I'm happy to keep hearing from folks and, and growing because, I, I, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, brother. We'll see you Thanks, soon. Paul. Yep. Bye. All right.